Um, before we get started uh, with our panel discussion, um, I'm going to introduce all the panelists um, who have taken time out their uh, busy schedule uh, to participate um, in this great event. So we're very excited uh, to see what they have to share uh, with, the, with us on this afternoon. So we'll get started uh, with the introductions. Uh, first one we have um, is our very own. Um, he's an ICC professor in criminal justice, Mr. Dr. Anthony White. Our next panelist um, is the Chief Diversity Inclusion Officer for the City of Peoria, uh, Mr. Dr. Ferris Muhammad. <laughs> Our next uh, panelist uh, is a professor in uh, humanities, um, our very own ICC, uh, Ms. Um, Ty Titonia Vargas. I give you a hand. I'm Titania. Sorry. Titania, I'm sorry. Titania Vargas. Don't okay, worry sorry about, about that. I was practicing it all the way up, but then I'm, of course I knew I would mess it up, but I apologize. Thank you for that correction. Our next panelist, um, someone I've known for a very long time. Uh, we used to play basketball together um, in high school. Yeah, I know I'm short, but I do used to play basketball. So. Um, he's the Director of Social Emotional Learning for Peoria Public Schools, Mr. Derek Booth. Our next panelist is our, one of our very own students. Uh, he's a sophomore, a business management major. Uh, he's a part of our Harvest and Dreams program, uh, Mr. Bobby Birch. <laughs> Last but not least uh, is another one of our ICC uh, professors uh, in humanities, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Ballridge. So we'll get started uh, with our panel discussion. Uh, we have some questions uh, for all the panelists. Uh, the first question that we'll ask, everyone will answer. Then after that, uh, we'll have Pacific panelists that will answer those and stuff. So once we go through uh, all the questions, then we'll have a Q&A uh, for the audience. So we'll get started. Uh, we'll start with you, um, Mr. Dr. Anthony White. Um, please share a personal story describing some way you were affected by race or a situation you witnessed that was affected by race. First of all, I'd like to say thank you and hello to everyone here for attending this important summit to learn, all of us. For me, just to sit and say a one personal story that just had a profound effect on me would not really do justice to all those that came before me, that put me here. So one story, but I'm gonna tell you an experience that would compass everything. Grandmother, mother's mother, 34 years, at, uh, on the floors at the place where you do the ice skating in New York, uh, Rockefeller Center, that she worked as a cleaning lady. Her mother before her was a born slave. That lady had a profound effect on me as a, as a person where she sat down and explained to me, listen, this is who you are and the circumstances you find yourself in at birth you have to be better than many others to attain the same. That advice for the next 55 years, you could say currently today, has had a profound impact because sometimes I realize that what I do and how I do it and when I do it, it's not just all about me but those that come after me as well. So I'm very conscious of who came before me who's with me on the panel, who's out here, but also who's coming after me. So my race, that's a part of me. It does have a profound impact, like I said already, by her words to me, teaching me that you can't walk on water, but you gotta learn to swim, boy. And obviously, like many here and many out here, we've learned to swim quite well in spite of current conditions. So even though y you have that behind you, you realize that you are an anomaly, hence why you try to teach others after you that are coming. This is an anomaly because it's not the regular that you would see like this. If you can do the math, I'm not speaking outside of the box, the math is there. 
an African-American male PhD. That's, that's a rarity. So with that comes the responsibility that my grandmother taught me, and I still carry that today. Make mistakes, sure, but it's the quality and the intent sometimes behind those mistakes because I know that I'm not just walking for me, but for a lot of other people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. Muhammad. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Everyone hear me in the back okay? Yeah. Okay, good. So just uh, to give you some context related to, I guess, my experience with uh, race or racism that have shaped who I am today, uh, so growing up, I was born and raised in Detroit, and so growing up at the, as early as, somebody from the D? Yeah. All right, that's mad love. Okay, so I was like five years old, and uh, the house I lived in was a lot of, uh, uh, as in modern day sense, you say it's a trap house. Anybody from here? Never mind. Um, so at one point, my house was uh, raided as a child by police officers when I was the age of five years old, and so I remember it vividly at that early age, just looking around me, seeing, who had positions of power. So in that context, it was police officers, it was social workers, it was judges who had the decision to say, hey, this child is going to a foster home or not. And so it was like either the store owners at the corner throughout the neighborhood in Detroit on the east side. So it was always those people who had positions of power. Um, fast forwarding to a very uh, ex specific example. I was uh, age 16, I was in high school, and I had a vehicle, so I thought I was a big deal. I had a Toyota Corolla, but to me it was a Corvette at the time. Uh, <laughs> had like a little hatchback to it, I, I thought it was a sports car. Um, nevertheless, I was, and so in the context of Detroit, uh, you had what's called Eight Mile, and that was like the dividing line that if you're black, you don't cross Eight Mile, or you're gonna be in some trouble, right? And so I, I was courageous, I thought I knew a few places, I had a car and I had this young lady friend with me, I wanted to take her out to IHOP, and so I'm thinking I'm a big deal, gonna take somebody out. And so we go to IHOP, this is around December, November, around those winter years where you know you go in somewhere and you come out, it's dark, or you go in a place, it's not snowing, and you come back out, it's snowy. So after we get through eating our IHOP out in Dearborn Heights, you know, anytime you hear hikes, that sounds far out somewhere fancy, right? So you had Detroit, then you had Dearborn, then Dearborn Heights. So we're, in my mind, at early as 16, we're far out, right? So we're coming back, it's get, it have gotten dark after we ate. It's like six o'clock though, it's still early, but it's just dark outside. It starts snowing while we were eating. In the process of leaving, I felt like I'd seen this light in my rearview mirror. Not the red and blue, but just like the dome light. And I couldn't make sure that I was being pulled over or not, but I'm like, I'm black, I want to err on the side of safety and pull over. I don't want to be charged with fleeing and eluding or anything. So I pull over on this back street, which I made a mistake doing that. I was scared to death afterwards, but I make a right, I pull over on this side street. Police officers walk up to my vehicle. And the police officer, you know, sometimes if you, you know, you have your, your, your drive side door and they stand a little bit behind that door so you can't really see them unless you turn all the way around like this. And then you look kind of suspicious, you don't want to do too much moving when you're black, in my opinion, at that time. And so I roll my window down, I'm like, hey, yes, sir, officer. And mind you, the young lady's in my passenger seat the whole time and she thinks I'm an important person, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm a big deal in front of her. The officer say, hey, what are you doing out here? My heart dropped, I was scared to death all in front of my little young lady friend at the time. Um, and I, I was really puzzled by his question of what are you doing out here? He made sure he emphasized out here. And I was like, well, sir, we just coming from IHOP. We're headed back to Detroit right now. I'm not going to this yes, sir, no, sir kind of a, a thing. And then the gentleman says, uh, that, that's three minutes. Okay, give me 30 seconds more, I'll wrap it up. See, I'm the first one to break the rules, sorry. Um, anyhow, the gentleman said, hey, you uh, seem like you were swerving. And I was like, well, sir, it's snowing out here. Maybe it's a little slippery. Perhaps my front tire may be a little bit bald. He said, so you're driving an unsafe vehicle? You want me to tow this thing? No, sir, officer, just please. We're just trying to go back home. But that experience, the way he kind of approached me, said I need to learn more about the law and become an attorney, like Attorney Green over there, perhaps. Um, but it inspired me to say I have to learn more so I can try to figure out how to change the system so it's that it's fair for all people. So that was my experience. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Professor I think they spared my time up, I'm sorry. Are you? I, I think not oh, you're fine, you're fine. You're good. We appreciate you. Professor Vargas? Okay. Well, <laughs> I read the question and I've been debating which story, because unfortunately I have many. I have many, but I'm gonna tell you the first one, because it caught me off guard. I was not prepared and I was just living in the States for like my first 
three months or something like that when it happened, but it was a cold winter in Wisconsin. And I was at the Mexican store with my dear friend, Lina, who happened to be from Colombia. And we were at the Mexican store, my Lina were on business trying to get the side. We had little time to buy some groceries. And from the other aisle, I heard somebody a very hateful scream. You are in America and you speak English here. And well, that said it all. I was not prepared for that. It was the first time that I encountered that kind of situation. I was not expecting it. And after that, you don't exactly know what to do. You don't know what to say. You just are completely silent. You don't, you don't have a response for that. Even after, what is it, 17 years, I think about that day, I think about that night constantly. It's uh, set my understanding of how things were going to be. And unfortunately, as I said, that was not the first time. Many times, it also had been a lot to do, it had a lot to do with uh, the way in which I sound. It's always question. Um, my intelligence is always questioned because of the way in which I sound. Um, I've been told many times, I am Mexican, I was born and raised in Mexico, and many times I've been told Mexicans don't do this, Mexicans don't go to college, Mexicans don't get master's degrees, Mexicans don't. And well, that's my few stories. Thank you, Professor Vargas. <laughs> Mr. Booth. Yeah, just, um, First of all, thanks for, thanks for having me here, a part of the pan panel, and um, I appreciate seeing all the students uh, in the audience today, not only ICC students, but high school students uh, from Manuel and uh, Peoria High, and I think some Richwood students are here as well, so welcome to all of you. Um, but just briefly, just to share um, an experience that me and my wife kind of experienced uh, within the last year uh, with our uh, daughter, uh, Gianna. Gianna, we started, we put her in, um, a preschool program, um, probably right around the age of two. Um, and the preschool was a wonderful program academically, uh, preparing her um, in, in many different areas academically. But Gianna was one of the, the few um, uh, students of color in the entire school. And that wasn't the, that wasn't the issue though. Um, you know, after spending time at the school and over the course of her getting educated over the, a year or two, um, we started noticing that there's no dolls that look like Gianna. Um, there's no pictures on the walls that look like Gianna. Um, all of the books that the students were reading or the, or the teachers were reading to the students uh, didn't reflect uh, a culture that Gianna was accustomed to. And so we started to notice also Gianna started uh, having this complex about being the darkest one in the class. Um, and Gianna, who to me is like the most prettiest girl in the whole wide world. Yeah, start thinking she wasn't pretty because she didn't look like everybody else. Uh, and so my wife went to the director of the the, the, uh, the school and said, and said, I just you know, I'm not blaming you for doing anything intentional, um, and just really tried to handle the situation with soft gloves initially, um, but. Um, there needs to be dolls that looks like my daughter here. There needs to be books that reflect uh, a culture my daughter can relate to. There needs to be pictures on the walls uh, that reflect my daughter. Uh, and then about a little while later, um, it was during the summer, um, my daughter was at a birthday party with one of her friends and it was a party that was outside in the park. And so the sun was out. And so when Gianna and uh, my, my wife came and came home, I said, man, you've been in the sun. You've gotten dark. And she said, no. And she ran to look in the mirror. She was like, no. And that was like the straw to break the camel back for me and my, my wife. And so my wife went back to the school and says, you know, what are your thoughts on some of the things that we talked about? And she shared with uh, my wife, she said, you know, I talked about it with the staff. And we don't think any of that's an issue here. And so needless to say, my daughter doesn't attend school there anymore. Um, 
And so that was uh, uh, a near and dear issue that we've seen up front uh, on how uh, inequities uh, and a lack of cultural competence impact my family, my daughter. Thank you, Mr. Booth. Mr. Bobby Birch. <laughs> All right, a story that I have is, it was me and a group of friends who was at one of our friend houses in Dunlap area. And it's a park that, down the street, which we shoot hoops at. So we decided to go out there and walk to the park. It was about three of us. As we were walking, the police approached us. Cause you know, in Dunlap, it's a lot of white people there. So for us to be walking down there, to him, we looked at suspicious. So he stopped us and asked us where we were going. We told him to go play basketball. It was obvious because we had the basketball in our hand, dribbling. So as we talked to him, he started harassing us, asking to check our bags and all kinds of stuff. And he was like kind of aggressive with it. So he made us call our mom and stuff. We had to go back home. He questioning them. It was just ridiculous. And that just made me feel uncomfortable because we wasn't bothering nobody. It was other kids playing outside with their friends, but we couldn't walk down the street to go to the park. And that just was unnecessary to do all that. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Professor Ballridge. Yes, sir. Can you all hear me? I don't know who thought giving me a microphone was a good idea. Um, 10 years ago, I would have resisted this question strongly because I grew up in a poor migrant farming community and I firmly believed that I had gotten where I had gotten. I got a PhD from U of I and that was my work. I did that. I'm not that person now, so instead I'm gonna tell you what has not happened to me. I have a five-year-old son and a seven-year-old son. I have never had the talk with them. I've never been afraid to be sassy. If a cop pulled me over and I thought he was wrong, I told him about it. I have never been called a terrorist or a thug or been asked what I was up to just based on what I was wearing. I have never had my intelligence or citizenship or worth questioned because of my accent. That is white privilege and I have it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ballridge. Uh, my partner, um, part of TNT, Ted, will be up next. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Todd mentioned that we are going to take questions after we get through the whole panel. So if you, if you have questions, be sure to jot them down so that you can ask them when we're, when we're done with our questions here. So our next question is, and we're going to uh, direct it to just certain people on the panel and everybody will get their turn. But this one is directed to Dr. Muhammad and, and Mr. Booth. From your perspective, how would you define the problems of racial injustice? And why don't you begin? Okay, I'll begin? Yep. Okay, so problems of racial injustice, I think this, the panel here just kind of spoke to many other problems. I think uh, Dr. At the End just kind of spoke to it very effectively highlighting racial um, privilege um, or white privilege in that regard. So it's just people have different experiences based on race uh, that's often problematic. So I think when you start talking about the uh, concept at least of uh, Racial injustice, to me, when you think in terms of justice, you think in terms of fairness, you think in terms of fair treatment, equity. So if those things are not happening based on race, then certainly that's problematic. But beyond that, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, the impact that it has just across various types of industries. Uh, throughout the session today, we had a lot of different conversations about what is racism. I think uh, the speaker earlier today, uh, uh, Dr. Burke, kind of spoke about the concept of racism and who can be racist and how racism is a system of advantages based on race that allows for people who are in power to be able to discriminate against a whole other race of people. And I think still to this day, when you look across the various industries, whether it's in criminal justice, the system of jurisprudence, education, uh, local government, whatever those industries are, you can still find disparities based on race. And I just think those systems need to be changed as it continuously um, prevents certain populations of people based on their, their skin tone or their phenotype from achieving and having access to various things. 
I know I spoke earlier for an example about, um, uh, if you look at the state of Oregon, for an example, in Portland, they had recently passed a state law that says that previous salary cannot be a factor when determining what kind of offer to make to someone. Because historically, of course, when you look at women and you look at people across racial lines, have often earned less than white people. So if you look at it and say, okay, well this person earned this much, so we can pay them this much, then you would never really close that equity gap that happens across racial lines. So I think when you look at racial injustice, a problem across all industries, and they really have to take some, uh, some, some firm and bold steps to bring about that type of change. And again, I think Dr. Berkman, she asked a question about not framing the conversation to where it's in like binary opposition to each other as far as am I racist or am I not, but saying, hey, am I perpetuating racism, and if so, how? I think that's a better question that we need to grapple with to help bring about change and help advance racial equity. Thank you. <laughs> when I think about racial inequities, I, I think about how it exists in uh, multiple systems. Um, and Dr. Muhammad mentioned the criminal justice system is um, one of the first that come to mind uh, when you think about 87% of the individuals that are incarcerated um, are of color, although research clearly shows that most crimes are not committed by people of color. Um, along those lines, when you think about giving opportunities and second chances for individuals who may be convicted of a crime, one of the common application, uh, questions on application is have you been convicted of a felony? Um, and so how um, uh, though being convicted of those crimes are literally life sentences when it comes to um, an having an economic impact and being able to take care of your family and buy a home um, and, and buy a car and buy food and put food on your table. Uh, but when you think about having the opportunity to be expunged or, or, or sealing your, your, your records, your criminal justice record, uh, you have individuals that want to hold the fines and fees that are uh, leveled out, given out to people of color at astronomical rates. Uh, much more higher than individuals not of color. Uh, so you're in a catch-22. Uh, I need a job to pay my fines and fees to get my records expunged, but I can't get a job because I have this on my record. And so it keeps individuals living in these cycles of poverty, in these cycles of uh, desperation and uh, with little hope. I also see the system uh, of community development as an area of racial injustice. Uh, when you think about the majority of African Americans just here in Peoria alone, they reside in the 61605 zip code. Uh, that zip code is the second most economically distressed zip code in the state. It's the 46th most economically distressed zip code in the country, but yet it's the least invested zip code over the last 30 years in this community. Uh, when you see 50% of the properties in the zip code that contains our African Americans, 50% of the properties are either boarded up vacant lots now or abandoned houses, there's an issue with that. And those for me are racial injustices that are in systems uh, that we live in today. Um, but all of them translate into economic development um, for individuals to be able to achieve higher or do better. They get stuck in this cycle of poverty. Uh, so those are some areas. Thank you. Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. White and uh, Mr. Bobby Birch. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Mr. White. Uh, what are the barriers that prevent racial justice? The question is really broad. It's so broad, but it's an excellent question. And I thought about this off and on from the time I received it. Misinformation, disinformation, outright lies, painting a portrait of a group of people that doesn't exist, which makes it easier to say that's other, that's not me. Because to do the things that have been done and continually to be done, whether it's systemic or institutional racism, that person can't be like you. Because we cannot do what we do to people if we embrace them and we see them as equal and us. If we can get and move beyond this whole thing of the pigmentation of my skin is already a minus, 
then the rest will follow uh, uh, in terms of equ equality and equity and, 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 and stopping this injustice, racially charged injustice, specifically here to question. The media and takes behavior and, and, and blows it up. I'm not going to say all of the media, no. But clearly, the books we read, the visions we see, all of this is just, we ingest it, we ingest it. Oh, that's good. We don't know people. We've never been on the other side, Eight Mile, that Brother Muhammad was talking about. We haven't gone across the street to see what it's like over there for real. So we take the sensationalized news. And we blow it up, and that's the image we put in our minds. So that's other. That's not me. That's them. And I'm going to treat, not everyone does this, but people do this because we're fed this. This is, this is the, the main problem, is, is separating this us and them. You over there, I'm over here. You're different from me. We don't understand each other, but the problem is many people, under, like for instance, I probably understand folks that don't look like me, white folks, more than you understand me. Why? Because I had to assimilate a bit into your world, but you haven't looked beyond your TV set into mine. It, it, makes, it, it makes it difficult then to eradicate racial injustice as long as you're seeing that and not me. I'm no threat to you, just like no one else walking down the street, yet you'll cross the street on me at a given moment in time, and I'm really as scared of you. <laughs> that's, with the amount of time, that's done. Thank you, Professor White. <laughs> Mr. Bobby. I'm gonna keep mine short and simple. Yeah. All right, basically, I think people's problem is they judge a book by its cover. See, because I'm black, they look at me as a bad guy, which is wrong. Like a few of my friends have dreadlocks, <laughs> and we'll go in like the store or something, we get followed. But a group of white people come to the store, and they, the employees that speak to them say hi and go about their business, but follow us around the store. In reality, we probably got more money than them. And it really doesn't make sense to me. Like, I feel that everybody should just be treated equally and not be judged off your looks, but uh, off your personality instead. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Back to Ted. Okay, so this question is for Mr. Booth and Dr. White. How do you define equity, and what does it look like today in central Illinois? I'll start with Mr. Booth. Sure, sure. Um, how I define uh, equity is literally having every decision uh, that needs to be made, whether that's a public decision or a private decision, uh, take into consideration the impact that that decision is going to have on every demographic, positive or negative, but also every level of that decision for um, whether we're talking about community development, whether we're talking about um, employment, whether we're talking about um, uh, starting new initiatives, how is this going to impact everyone and taking everyone into consideration? Um, for me, that's um, having an equity, uh, equitable uh, lens. And in central Illinois, one of the things that I do see um, it, it are leaders in place, starting to be in place and to, uh, to speak up at, that are at the table making these decisions. Um, I increasingly see uh, individuals that make decisions that impact the lives of others uh, have this equitable lens. And I think Central Illinois has a lot of work to do. Have a, have, they have a lot of ground to make up. As I mentioned earlier, for this, we've kind of been digging ourselves over 30 years, but I am glad to see that individuals are starting to speak up, that individuals that are at the table um, with this equitable uh, uh, lens but that's what equity is to me. And it's not always about the number. Um, that's, for me, it's more equality. Uh, but equity is more, for me, that, that, journey, that journey that can allow everyone the opportunity to get to whatever that number is. So. Thank you. It's 
It's interesting when you look at that word equity, and I always look at equity and I look at the outcomes. Um, <laughs> because if, I, if you can look at an organization, I'm gonna just, a theoretical organization, and you look at how many employees are there, and then you say, oh, everything is, the hiring process is, is great, we're really fair with everyone, and everyone has an equal opportunity to apply, the vetting system and all of that is rah, 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 okay? Now, you look at the end though, the end number, <laughs> it's almost negligent of anyone of color, any type of minority in the outcome. But you can't put your finger on where this process is not permitting people of color to gain access into that career field. This is where equity has to step in. There, there's something there that it could be a conscious bias or it could be one that's subtle and you don't know it. But you have to go in there and kind of make it a little bit user friendly for those people that have not been, you haven't been friendly towards. Because the, the way it's set up is that we just can't look at today. You have to look at the whole everything comes with us, comes forward. You just can't look at a person today and say, you're not getting this job for this reason and that reason, but there's a whole history behind that, why someone might not score as someone else. I'm not sitting here saying give away anything, but you have to level that field and give a bump where necessary. If you don't do that, you will always have those outcomes that have a discriminatory look to them. Because not only must we be fair, we have to appear to be fair. And when everyone that looks like me looks at an organization and they don't see themselves reflected in it in some form or fashion, you say, no, that organization is not for me, it's not about me, but the organization has to then look back at everything that it's doing to make it equitable for everyone to see over the fence. Mm -hmm. Just equality, yeah, we can have, make it equal, but all of us didn't go to schools in Dunlap. Some of us went to school right downtown, and we know the quality of education looks different. So you're gonna tell me that said student that comes out of this school and said student out of that school, oh, they're equal, they both have high school degrees, come on, stop it. Look at what everyone is coming forward, and a, make it equitable that everyone can see over the fence and gain access to lower those discriminatory numbers that are out there. Because they're there, they're in your face. This is a, a no-brainer. There's a reason why people aren't getting over those hurdles. You're not giving away anything. It's when everyone, the human capital, we need everyone. You're actually hurting the economy when you keep people out. That's my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question for the panelists, and uh, this is for our professors, um, for Professor uh, Ballridge and Vargas. Uh, what are the challenges of discussing uh, racial justice in the classroom or academic setting? Uh, we can start with you, uh, Professor Vargas. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, what I do is I teach Spanish as a foreign language, so for me it's a little bit harder because I concentrate on the language rather than the skill. But later on, when we are in advanced classes, um, we have the opportunity to talk about um, immigration, especially. Um, and it, it's a very difficult topic. And it's difficult because many times we don't know how to approach. And my encounter is students are afraid of hurting somebody else's feelings and they don't want to get hurt and and it's a it's a very it's a sensitive topic and it's it's difficult but uh if students are willing to listen and to learn i i start if they ask me i usually I don't start talking about things like that if they don't ask me but if they ask me they are curious then i i will one one question um, a few years ago, students asked, asked me, um, I'm sorry for using this term, I don't like using this term like Dr. Burke, but the student said, um, so how come those people want to be illegal? And I said, I mean, they don't want to be undocumented. The system makes them illegal. 
And they said, but how come? I said, but what do you think the system, how the system works? And they said, well, you just go and do the right thing and then you get your papers. I said, well, that will be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. And they started the question, so I follow up on that. But I don't start it if they are not willing to listen. They have to be willing to listen and willing to learn. And then we can have that sort of discussion. Thank you so much, Professor Vargas. Professor Ballridge. So unlike Titania, I'm an instigator and a pot stirrer, and I like to cause trouble. So I do start the conversations, but the problem there is that I'm a white delivery vessel, right? And so what does this white blondie chick have to tell me about any of my experiences or anything about race? And so, Where's Dr. Ali? I, hi, I was getting ready to teach this unit uh, focusing on the fourth season of The Wire, which is the education season, but The Wire's pretty racy. Um, and I was also worried that it was coming from me. And so I went and had a meeting with Dr. Ali before the semester even started. Like, what does this look like that this white teacher lady is throwing this material at me? And so we talked about um, the difference between me speaking as an authority on these issues versus me giving them space in my classroom and acknowledging that these are legitimate experiences that are worthy of academic inquiry. And so I think uh, white instructors might be reluctant to make race an issue be because it seems like an issue. We don't talk about white, right? The issues of white privilege and all of the racial issues that come along with whiteness. And I have largely students who are people of color, so how is that going to be received? But I think when you think of it as a representation issue and honoring those experiences, it makes a lot more sense. And then the second issue is for white students not knowing what words to use, this discomfort, like I can't talk about this because I don't want to be the person who is labeled racist. And I said during our conversations, I echoed what Dr. Brooks said, like, we have to start putting black lives as a much higher priority than white egos. So I, you know, talking about the stakes there, but I also give them vocabulary before we even start watching The Wire. We talk about how do we talk about people of different nationalities? What words do we use? What does white privilege mean? What does racism mean? So that we're not throwing around terms with different definitions in our heads. So I think equipping them with vocabulary to make it a more comfortable conversation, and then also inviting brilliant people like Dr. White <laughs> and Dr. Ralph Murphy to come talk about their experiences so they have some other voices in the classroom. All right, thank you. Thank you Professor Ballridge. All right, uh, that's all the questions we have. Uh, is there anything else uh, anybody on the panel would like to add um, to the discussion? Um, are we going to Q&A? Anything else? Or... All right. Let's give our panel a hand. And now we'll go to a Q&A. Uh, so if you have a question, I think we have somebody that has a mic. So you can raise your hand, and uh, she will get to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question. Um, I've been, I had, I'm Amir Sykes, hi everyone. I'm a, a sophomore at Manuel High School. Um, in my experience at Manuel High School, I've realized that Manuel has a black history class that it's optional to take. And I've taken the class, and I can say that the experience that I've had in that class hasn't been necessarily what I've been looking for. Oh and I'm just trying to understand, does the district really see the necessary need to really teach that class, and why is it an optional class? I think that that class should be probably a mandatory choice, because I think that in order for black students to especially be successful, they ought to know about their history. 
and the things that we learn about in that class are repeating course. Everyone knows about our wonderful heroes, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. So when are we gonna start learning about the things and the other heroes that are unspoken of, like Marcus Garvey and those who really don't get talked about? Who would like to uh, tackle that one? I'll be willing to, Marty. Yeah. I'll be more than happy to chime in and, okay. uh, you, and you can piggyback. First of all, it's a, a great question, Mr. Sites. Absolutely, and oh, okay. Oh, okay. Dr. Karan. I'll definitely defer to her. Yeah, go, go ahead, Coach, and I'll, I'll... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, where's the mayor? He has, been, he has been sending me emails. I appreciate this young man. <laughs> um, and guess what I did? I put him, the state has a committee yeah. Um, regarding this issue in terms of African American mm -hmm. history and, um, and making it mandatory and a mirror is on that list um, to represent Peoria, not only the Peoria County but also Peoria Public Schools. And so board members are here and we have, we have there are three board members here. So um, we have Ms. Jackson and Ms. Ross and um, I think it's really needed and it's about time. Um, as superintendent, it's, you know, I've sort of inherited this system when we talk about all, all we've been hearing about is systems, right? And how difficult it is to move the system. It is possible and I think we're getting there. We're getting very, very, very close to um, getting there. But it, and for me also, Amir, it's not only about making it mandatory, but also having quality people to really teach it like you know, the professors uh, mentioned. So it's more than just okay. It's mandatory. All gonna, all gonna get this class. Who is qualified, and and how is that training? What what is that training going to look like? And so yeah, I know board members. Actually, the board would literally. That's a board policy, right? That's it's it's actually a policy issue. And I know when uh, Dr. Ali was planning this thing, part of this conversation is eventually to maybe change policies and practices, so that's a really good one. Thank you. Who else has a question? Oh, no, just to pity back off that, because we discussed that in our group. Um, I had a problem with District 150 when my kids were going, and I spoke to counselors. They told me that my children could not take black history until their junior year, and it was an optional class, but not in my house, it was mandatory. So it needs to be part of the curriculum, I think, but I do appreciate Dr. Karat for saying that. Anybody else? We got somebody back there. <laughs> Sorry, again, I have another question. Um, one thing that I do see um, I live on, I currently live on the south side of Peoria, and I have a question for the people who are currently in our leadership roles. Do they really know the condition of the south side of Peoria? And I wonder, do they actually take the time out of their busy schedules to come down and really experience what really goes on? And at times, I feel like they are the father that makes a decision for us because not once have I seen a time where anyone has came to ask questions from the community to ask what would be best for the city and for the citizens together instead of what would be best for the city. A lot of the times I do see that everyone's starting to move out of the south side of Peoria only because that the leaders there haven't been making the proper decisions to ensure that it's a safe environment and an environment where people can actually live and enjoy life. So leadership role, anyone in here want to answer that question? Because I'm certainly, I certainly want to know the answer to that. Why? 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 Where, where, where's the help at? That was a, a great comment, but I'm not sure we have Anyone to respond? So let's, were there any other questions? I think. Oh, thank you so much. 
That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Young man, I really appreciate yeah. you coming up with this, I'm telling you. Oh, you know, I'm, over I'm here. a worker in the community, but I want to say this to you. The South Side has got to step up too, sweetheart. And you know where they got to step up? At the ballot box. Do you understand? It's over 11,000 registered voters in the first district. That's 61605 and 61603. There's an election coming up on April the 2nd. If you 18 years old by that time, get yourself registered and vote. Because I don't want to see a voteless people in this city anymore. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Manuel High School has three precincts, five, six, and eight. Look on your voter registration card and it'll tell you where you are. And in the primary, there were 102 people went to vote. Now, this is a problem. And I'm telling you, I'm thanking you for this opportunity because I've been wanting to say this for a long time. <laughs> we have got to do better. You go home and tell your parents to get out and vote. Start paying attention. You can run for mayor of this city and change this. You understand? I mean, don't act like your vote don't count, because it does. So, so far we've had some, um, some great questions. I know a lot of this, we, we just wanna talk about it and unpack, and we will get an opportunity to do that in our breakout sessions in a little bit. But if there are questions, we would like them in this space to direct them towards the panel, if you possible. Address it, Mikey? All right, I'm coming up. And if I could just address the little brother one more time, though. Uh, first, can, I, I love the little brother's question. Can we give him another round of applause for this plan of Curry? And just briefly touching on your question earlier, though, as you spoke to the uh, ideal of black history being optional, in education, as you all are educators, and here we are aware of the research that shows that uh, when black people don't see themselves reflected positively in school curriculum, they tend to become disengaged, and you see that start to reflect in their academic achievement. So listen to the young brother's frustration, it almost sound like he's on the brink of being disengaged, based on not seeing himself reflected positively in school curriculum, or not seeing enough representation from historical black leaders who have contributed to this country and other countries throughout the diaspora, Africa, et cetera. So I just like the idea that you brought that up, and I hope that other young African-American students in here, whether you're in K through 12 or at the college level, stay engaged and bring those kind of concerns to leadership, as the young man just did, so that you won't become disengaged, but instead, be the uh, uh, agent for change that can help contribute to the way we learn better. So thanks again, young brother, appreciate that. We have one question up here. Okay, so um, I'm personally very passionate about colorism. For those of you who don't know that, what that is, it's within the black community of thinking that those um, who are light-skinned are better than, they're treated differently. There's a whole difference, oh, do you like light skins or dark skins? And um, it's really created a divide within the black community. And um, I think that's something that needs to be addressed because if we're attacking each other, we're not focusing on the bigger issue, in my opinion. And it's sad that within our community, on average, the black a black person can only keep one dollar for one hour compared to whites and Asians who can keep a dollar for 23 hours. And so I just want your guys' opinion on colorism within the black community, how to tackle that, and how to set ourselves up more successfully. Thank you. Young princess, I, I love your, your, um, your question. It's one that's rife. First of all, it's, it's been around for millennia and centuries, that, that, that schism between lights and darks within our stream of blackness, if we call it this then. Um, that is something that's there, that's a psychological issue as well, that's impacted our community to such detrimental the effect of that alone, it goes all the way back, as you know from your readings, and maybe if you get the class as well, you'll learn that the biracial has, has been afforded certain opportunities, more so than someone of my complexion and darker, 
and that's historically known and we know that. That's something within our culture that we have to be mindful of and stop in some ways thinking that being dark is a bad thing or the quality of our hair. I don't understand that one um, from a different perspective because hair is hair and whether mine is short and curly, it is beautiful or it is like yours is long and straight. Yet, those are images that, that, that impact even the way we would deal with one another. If you're light skinned, long hair, you're supposed to be a beautiful person versus someone who's dark skin with short hair. When you think that through logically, it's asinine. And that's a division that we have to, as a group, stop doing that. We have to stake a certain level of accountability for that us together, the way we treat each other. Now, I'm not silly, that's impacted by history. It is, but if we know that, then we have to consciously try to start changing that. Because to me, the whole spectrum of blackness is beautiful. I don't care if you light or you dark and all that foolishness. I don't care if you have good hair or no hair, and you still one of me and I'm one of you. You gotta buy out of that stuff and see through it and then correct those people that do it in the front of you. Correct them, just quietly, pull them to the side. That N word, get rid of it. Correct your people with that too. Because if you're demanding respect, show respect for ourselves too. And I mean, I'm just telling you what my Grammy told me. And it sticks with me because I'm proud and I'm an African American and I'm not gonna let you or anyone take that from me. Does that help you? Does that help you? Well, I'm on your page with you, and thank you for bringing it out. I'm on the page with you. And if I could just add to that as well, I think you brought up a, a great point, Dr. White, as far as uh, just being conscious and correcting people when they engage in behaviors that display colorism. Uh, I'm thinking about, in kind of, uh, Coach Booth, you kind of spoke to this earlier, but regarding your daughter and uh, the response she had to you saying she become, have became darker based on being in the sun. Uh, Dr. Danielle Beverly Tatum, in her book, Why Are All the Black Children Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, who's the uh, president emeritus of Spelman University out of Atlanta, she kind of said in her book at one point, just the language that we often use, uh, especially older generation, say things like, you've been in the sun, you've become black as hell. She said, you know, you have to reverse that language and say things like you're black as heaven and put more of a, a, a positive or appreciative inquiry on those kinds of things to show value in dark or blackness. So getting rid of some of that language like you're black as hell that tends to demonize a darker skin. It's like, how do we make sure that in our language that we become conscious of how we value the different skin tones amongst us? So I appreciate you, young lady, for bringing that uh, up as well. Thank you. Can I add one thing to that? Sure that can. also happens in the Hispanic community. You all are also questioned, and um, I can't think of the word. You are also questioned about the, the color of your skin, if you are lighter. I've been you know, uh, told many times, you, you're lucky by other people from Mexico. You're lucky. Oh, why? Because the tone of your skin is not so dark. And that really hurts because Everybody is beautiful. It doesn't matter where you are, how you sound, where you're from. We should not think about that. We should just listen, and that should be enough. Back any other questions? We do have some questions up here. Do we have, t we have time? Yeah. Yep, down in front. Okay. Uh, behind me? Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, my name is Carita Bright. I'm here uh, at ICC as a staff member. So I want to address my question to Mr. Birch as a younger individual, um, and then also uh, Professor Vargas. Um, when we talk about equity and justice and things like that, we know that that's a partnership, it's a two-way street. 
Um, and then we talk about social action and uh, engagement. Um, as a younger person, can you please kind of speak on what inspires you to act and what inspires you to participate so maybe we're better um, equipped to approach and to engage individuals of your age because it will take individuals as young as you, as young as me, as young as some of the other people in this audience. Uh, and then also, Professor Vargas, I deal with, uh, I work in the enrollment office, so I deal with a number of different individuals, but I do feel like undocumented um, students or uh, students who have parents who are undocumented are definitely more hesitant to participate uh, in the process or to advocate for themselves, whether it has to do with equity and justice or whether it's just, you know, and, and that could be as it relates to their education. So if either of you and anyone else that may be interested can speak to um, being inspired to participate or to engage um, in how we can keep individuals engaged and, and uh, definitely, Professor Vargas, because I, with, and not to sound political, but with the change in administrations, I feel like we are losing some of our students that are of Hispanic descent, so. Uh, all right. <laughs> Honestly, what I did was, I got close to God, so that changed my life. And I uh, dropped a lot of friends and put like positive people around me. Like a lot of people at ICC helped me a lot and brought attention to me that I need an education to be like very successful in life because that's gonna last forever. So that really just opened my eyes. Thank you so much for that question. I've been, I've been teaching at ICC for 15 years and I've been waiting for that. I actually been waiting for that because I think the community and in the community that are a lot of people undocumented uh, possible students that want to take classes but they are just afraid and they don't know how to, where to, who to ask and well I wish if like if we can start like a Santa Claus list in here like I know it's what March but if we could have like a Hispanic office, a Latino officer, somebody that can be there, speak their language, not necessarily speaking to them in Spanish because some of them, I mean, like the DACA students that are perfectly bilingual, they speak English perfectly without any uh, accents or anything like that, but uh, their parents don't. But somebody that can understand the culture, the community, how it works, it will be a great, great step in if there is a possibility, I would love to do that because I always, always, always appreciate the fact that I am in a position of, uh, I'm fortunate. I am in a, in a position of privilege, even though, because I, I am educated. And that's what I tell everybody that I come across, uh, that come to me and I say, stay in school. Stay in school, don't even think about it because that Nobody can take that away from you. It's yours forever and ever. And I'm here because I'm educated, and that's fortunate. So if I can help somebody else to do the same thing, I would love to do it. Count on me, call me, I will do it. Do we have time for another question? Yeah. I, I don't know if it's a question or more of a comment, and this young man here made me kind of think of it too. Um, I understand that black students want to see, have that black history class and, and see themselves reflected. Our white students need it too. Yes. All students need it. And so as an educator here at ICC, I mean, that's something that I've thought about my whole career, is how do we advocate for that? How do we advocate to have these classes for all of our students? but particularly our white students, because they need to know that history, and they need to know all of that as well. Thank you. And there's, there's a gentleman down here that's been patiently waiting. No, it's you. Okay, he just, just gave the mic to me. Um, I just want the panel to just please explain to the community and just explain to the little audience that we have the real importance of why we should really stress about having a black history class because 
like the, um, the professor over here, she explained that it's very necessary that especially students of white descent should know about our history. And they should because ill-advised people gain ignorant people. And ignorant people begin to make mistakes that they shouldn't have made just because they're ill-advised and ill-informed about other people's history. So if you can please explain to people why it's so very important that we press for that class and press for it to be nationally taught everywhere so that we can avoid these issues. Well, to piggyback off of what you just said, because you actually gave great reasons just in your uh, question on the importance of African-American history class being taught. Uh, but in, uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of uh, great role models and exposure to role models uh, of, 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 of blacks and African Americans throughout our history who have done amazing things from, in, uh, from inventions to, uh, to, to, to authors and being authors and in every uh, walk of life, that exposure and that education in that area is inspiring. Um, and someone mentioned earlier, it's also engaging uh, that when you see individuals in the textbook uh, that represent and reflects uh, your heritage, uh, in addition to uh, many of the things that you mentioned as well, is just to gain knowledge, not just for blacks, uh, but also for whites to understand uh, the heritage uh, of, of African Americans. Can I say something? Sure. Look, I'm trying to model what white people should do in these conversations, which is sit and shut up and listen. But, <laughs> Uh, white people need to know this history also because it is a history of us too. And I think there's this glorified idea of American history and the bootstraps and the whole American dream thing that it, we have wrong, right? That's not how things went down and that's not how I got sitting at this table. And I think having that misinformation is a disservice to us too. So I think another reason that white students need that is so that we find out how we really got here. We have a few minutes if anybody else wants to add to that. Okay, one more. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sandy Arreguin um, and uh, I, really, I really enjoy myself being here. Um, I lead TRIO Upward Bound and you know that's a pre-college preparation program so I'm, wor I'm working a lot with the high schoolers. Um, real quick, because I can go long. No, you're okay. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, we want the panel to respond. Um, yeah. But real quick, um, I, you know, I grew up in the south side of Chicago in a very bad neighborhood. Um, my story was very sad growing up, but doors open, which is, is what I'm hoping are the opportunities that, we're, that we know exist nationwide and that we know we, we can bring to students here. Um, being a Latina, there's not a lot, um, since we're talking about racial justice, I, I would hope, and maybe some of you can talk on this, um, that the issues also surrounding um, Latino students or other minority groups also are being considered and addressed through these conversations. Because um, I do, one of the things I've realized through my community advocacy, through the, my years here in Peoria, is that people don't understand um, what undocumented really means or what DACA is, or what legal permanent residency. I think I, I dealt with an issue with somebody not understanding what a green card was at one point and turning people away from the bus. So I mean, there's, there's really a lot of hot topics and our students here at, in, in the high schools are dealing with so much that I hope you know, some of you can speak on um, how do you address also racial justice and equity with other um, non-African non American groups um, so that it can be a big effort to work with everyone because there are so many minority groups not, um, outside of African American race. Well, well, I, I think Coach Booth kind of spoke to it earlier when he talked about uh, the definition of equity, essentially ensuring that people are at the table, in whether public or private, when decisions are being made, who's at that table to ensure that based on this decision that's about to be made, who will be impacted, who will benefit, who will be disadvantaged. So I think that's encompassing to all racial minorities or disadvantaged groups as far as from a, through an equity lens. So to your point, uh, as far as not just centering everything strictly on African Americans from a racial minority kind of a standpoint, but when you talk about racial equity and looking through a racialized lens uh, that's focused on equity, then I think that's inclusive to race and other uh, marginalized groups of people as well. And I'm gonna go back to what I was telling you before. We also need more representation, more Latinos, in general, working in, in higher positions, but how we get them 
to that spot? Well, we have to open the doors of college and we have to walk them through the system and let them see there is the possibility because many times we are afraid of college. And because of the reasons I was telling you before, you know, Mexicans don't or Hispanics can't, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to open the doors of education, more representation, and our voices have to be heard because we are here, we're here to stay and we wanna be heard, and we wanna be at the table. I want to be at the table, you want to be at the table, but I don't wanna be here by myself. I want, <laughs> yes, yes, especially in the students, I, you, you have no idea how many times I beg, I don't ask them, I said, please don't drop out, you need to stay in school. And I, it's just not to any minority student, every student that it's in my classroom, don't quit, stay, go for that PhD, go for more, don't stay there. That's, that's the door, that's the only, I'm sorry, I'm, a, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher. That's the door I see, education. That's, that's what I have. We have just a few minutes, if anybody else would like to add to that on the panel. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't have so much of a question as I have a statement, um, much like the woman over there. Um, I think um, in order to improve um, the knowledge of black history and um, to sort of, <clears throat> sorry, uh, essentially to piggyback off um, what this gentleman here was saying um, and the importance of a black history class, I think rather than having a mandatory black history class, what we need to do, um, not only as like a, a school district, but also as a country, um, is improve our history um, educations and um, how history is taught. Because um, historical miseducation is such a, um, is such a dangerous thing. And you can see it um, within a lot of um, like far right political mu uh, movements where they just really miss the mark on what was actually happening there. And I think that overall, if we um, gave a better, um, man if we improved history education and included um, not just the suffering of black people and other minorities, um, but also the um, amazing victories that um, people have done, not only just from civil rights and things of that nature, but also just in their day-to-day -day lives, then I th think that, um, like what um, Miss Burke said, um, colorblind racism would probably not be so prevalent. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Thank you. Thank you. Make one really quick, quick comment. I've been listening to everyone speak about the black history classes, and I think they're, trust me, phenomenal. I grew up with them. My office reflects my history. It does. Everybody is on the wall. But, no, it really is if you've been in there. Um, I think the, the, the problem that I'm hearing here is black history, white history, it's American history. And, and, and this is, it's just not, we're not being included in that history. When you start just separating, you can, we can have classes. No, we can have classes that specifically address this. But at the end of the day, black history is American history. And, and, and we're kind of like, like pushing it to the side. It is, you know, there was a, a black person named Anthony on the Mayflower. No one knew that, that came over with, with the first set of, and then even then, history starts before that. What about the peeps that were here first? And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is when we start like making it seem like black history isn't intrinsically a part of American history, then we got an issue. This is a lot more complicated and simple than just putting out a class like that because someone said it, the doctor said it. You have to have qualified people teach that class. Where are you gonna t talk about that? 
and are white people in that history lesson as well? Am I making, I hope I'm trying to, in, in a simpler, yeah. thank you. Thank you. If thank I could you. just add to that, I think you make a great point, Dr. White. And I think from my understanding of what the young lady was trying to say as well, it's the same kind of approach I take when you talk about equity, right? How do you infuse that in everything that you do, whether it's policy, whether it's practice, whether it's budget, whatever that looks like. And so to Dr. White's point about black history being a part of American history, yes, I think there is value in having an individualized class that's specifically focused strictly on the history that African Americans have contributed to in America. However, when you think about geography and various forms of science and math, I think it's important to incorporate in those courses uh, how have African Americans and other racial minorities contributed and impacted those areas throughout America's history. So I agree that it needs to be infused throughout all subjects, but I think there's still a specific need for individualized class that hones in on the, specifically the contributions that African Americans have made in this country. Thank you, thanks. So we're out of time, but let's give our panelists, this is great discussion, a big round of applause. Thank you. Turn it over to Rita. Let's also give a, a hand for our moderators, TNT. Thank you very much. So this has been very rich discussion. And, you know, when you hear what you've heard, you have to be changed by it. You can ignore it, but the soul knows. The, the soul knows what it's heard. We've heard a lot of truth today. Let's unpack it. What we're going to do now is go back into our breakout sessions to unpack what we've heard from our panelists, from our uh, people in the audience, the questions and the discussions, and let's unpack it.